So I'm feeding back on two of the sessions that I think we all were at because they were in here. So it may feel a little bit like deja vu, so just bear with me. But I think there were lots of really important and interesting things that came from those sessions for us to take away um, and use on our cultural journey as, as a city. Uh, so from the first, um, from our first session, which was driving change, I think the themes of people, identities and stories came out very strongly, and in particular, I think stories. And it's something that in Southampton we've been exploring throughout our City of Culture journey and onwards now, really thinking about what it is that makes us who we are. And there was a very evocative phrase used of, that we have to tell a story that reeks of Southampton. Um, and and we, I think we've come in closer to knowing what that is since we would have been working on this bit, but um, we still, I think, we've still got some work to do on finding out what that is. And part of that is also understanding our assets and our capabilities. I think that came out very strongly as something we need to, we're doing and we need to continue to do and that there are many assets and capabilities in our city that can surprise any one of us, even depend, no matter how long we've been living here, there's something around the corner that we never knew about. Um, another thing that came out of that panel, which then spoke really well to the, the panel afterwards about leadership, was uh, co-creation, co-production, and decentering programming of arts and cultures so that communities can take ownership over the things that they matter for to them. So um, the, an interesting phrase that Tom talked about was nothing about us without us. And I think that's mm. something that we could really take forward and, um, and design uh, our kind of cultural journey around. And, and that by doing that, we can enable access to culture to everyone in the city, not just in our shiny cultural quarter, but beyond, um, and just making sure that everybody has access, everybody signed up to it. And, and the very evocative phase from that panel was uh, the ring of shit. So um, <laughs> a cultural quarter and a ring of shit does not make a cultural city. And actually thinking about the fact that our city is not just the centre, but a lot of other things, shit or not, um, that, that make it up and just reconnecting and making sure that everybody is present in the conversation. Fine. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just One last wrap up the last, um, the final panel about creating good leadership really just built on that. So talking about how do we create uh, a governance and leadership culture in the city which represents everybody that, who is in there. And I think the most important and the most powerful thing that I took from that was um, uh, can we imagine differently? How can we imagine doing things differently? And that's our kind of responsibility at this moment in time in the city. Super, thank you. Kate Maple. Um, hi, I was at the um, Spotlighting our, our Young People, which was on at the John Hansard. Um, so that was the first one I went to. And um, there were five people on that panel, one of which was an artist and one was a young person. There was discussion about the fact that next time we do this, we want the whole panel to be all young people and we will facilitate that to happen if possible. Um, so we first started talking about a child-friendly city, which obviously Southampton is really going for, um, hoping to be awarded it in 2025, and that 5,000 young people have already been consulted with about that and that culture is mandatory for the child-friendly city. I wasn't particularly aware of that. It may be that I just wasn't paying attention, but culture being mandatory is, is really exciting to me. Um, and the young people have talked about the fact that family and belonging um, is really important to them. Being safe and secure is really important, and that health is also really important. There's, that's their top three priorities. So it's looking at how we work with culture to address some of those um, concerns and issues. Um, Leon was amazing. He was the apprenticeship that was there. He'd been through the um, city council system and had been awarded um, an apprenticeship uh, with distinction. He felt that young people weren't communicated with very well, and I think that was a really significant aspect. Um, we had Amy from Beat Freaks, who was talking about the fact that 
Young people engage with culture in very different ways these days, and it's a rapidly changing environment. We really need to make sure that we're aware of that. We are living in a time where 90% of young people that they um, consulted with considered themselves to be creative through online, through TikTok, and many other platforms as, you know, as artists, gallery exhibitions, podcasts, radio, music, you name it. Um, so actually it's more about how we meet them on their creative journey and um, Louise Govier from Artswork pointed out that actually a lot of young people are just doing it anyway. So where is our role in this, which is quite significant. Um, Kwame was talking about actually being part of the process of you can't be what you can't see, uh, which is what something Shantae said earlier, that actually he felt his role in educating young people about Africa and African music and culture and storytelling was being part of that process, which is quite a significant um, role to play. Um, so the question we had was about how we bring young people into our planning. And the ultimate thing was really about listening and then acting, but demonstrating that action, because there's an awful lot of consultation going on, but where is the action and how do we demonstrate that? But a great thing uh, that was talked about was getting radical. And although we talk about having people around boards, uh, and inviting people around the table, perhaps we should smash that table completely and look at reinventing a new system, which I, I say, yeah, let's yes. do it. But going back to what um, Slung Low, the guy from Slung Low said, change is hard. Bringing young people onto a board of trustees, that's hard, hard to do because the language is not set up for them. Maybe we just don't need those boards structured in that way because it's set up for young people to fail. So how do we think about that? Um, uh, what was I was going to say, it's very important to have intergenerational conversations. That's what came out of one of the conversations. Um, and an intersectional approach to people from all different experiences, not just, right, we need to speak to young people, let's go here. Let's actually talk across the generations about how they feel about issues affecting young people. Listening's a, a long process. That came out really clearly. And it also came back to something that um, Nazni was summing up about the fact there's no lack of talent in our city, but there's a lack of opportunity for young people. So that issue about people leaving the city, actually, we need to, we really need to, to address that. Um, aspiration, talking about pushing boundaries, what aspirational um, ideas young people may come up with and support them to really push what their comfort zone. Um, Leon said, young people get failed all the time and it makes them disengage. I thought this was a really, really powerful point. He also said that he believes that we can, with you know, true, authentic effort to rebuild that trust, it can be done. And he felt that he was living proof of that through his one-to-one -one mentorship, which takes time and funding. He has, on a personal level, been able to change his life around to a certain extent. And and develop new skills and uh, you know, a, a, a worthwhile career, he felt. Um, Kwame said, we need to give young people the money. We need to give them the power, give them the money, and they will do amazing things with it. Um, finally, just from that one, Amy said, uh, who's from Birmingham, she said, from the outside looking in, she felt there's so many people in this room, there's so much energy and collective will to do this. She has not seen that in other cities. And I thought that was really powerful because sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but I can't see that because I'm working from the inside. So that fact that somebody from the outside coming in can really see it and felt it was really tangible, said it was really exciting. So I, was, I looked at um, two of the panel sessions, Developing Heritage and uh, Reaching Across the Region. So on develop, Developing Heritage, the first and overriding thing that came out of it was it's not just about buildings and the built environment. It's much, much more about um, our stories and our history. Um, some of the key opportunities that we've seen is um, that there are under, underused and totally disused heritage buildings within the city that could take a real lead from the Dancing Man Brewery where they've brought a, a, a building back into life. It's got a relevance in the modern age. Um, I think we can just maybe look at some of those things that we can perhaps get people to look at some of these buildings that I don't even know exist and I walk around the city a lot um, and bring them back into use. We've spoken about this a lot today, um, but two million people moving each way through the city through a year, we can't ignore. We really do need to find a way to tap into these cruise customers as a captive market. They're already here. Lots of cities that have got um, a tourism offer would love to have two million untapped customers that have already made the decision to go there. We're just going to make sure we get them out of their hotels and their cars and into the city a bit earlier. Um, and, and no, this was never actually said, but I wrote it down because it's what it said to me, was if we can properly inform the people of Southampton of our heritage, we've got 260,000 tour guides here already. 
I think that was a really powerful takeaway for me. Some of the key challenges um, from our group it was getting a consensus of what heritage actually is. Um, how do we choose the bits we want to celebrate? Cost. Um, again, throughout today, we've spoken about during these times of uh, financial uh, difficulties, sometimes heritage and culture looks like it's one of those things that we can say, well, we can put a red line through that, nothing's really changed, and, and we can afford not to do it. Not true. Um, finding a sustainable operating model when times are tough, too. Quite often, the focus is inevitably shifts to survival rather than engagement. Obviously, the entire reason for existing is, is to engage with your audience, and that's not always easy when it's difficult. How do we tap into cruise passengers again? Um, investment is key to engendering pride, and I think this is another part that if we can get the people of Southampton it properly engaged with our heritage and, and heritage in the broader sense, which is our histories and our stories, then they're going to do the job for us. Um, and I think we need an ambassador programme, we need to roll out to schools. Don John was very passionate about making sure that, that as children are growing up in this city, they learn about the history of this city. Not about the Mayflower and the Walls, but about our recent history, about the history of, of communities growing throughout the past hundred years. Um, so we can definitely work harder on that. Um, there's a lot of untapped potential. A really, really uh, great green light from uh, Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, the, we had a real boom period 10 years ago. We applied for lots of funding. The last 10 years have been quite lean, and they're surprised that we haven't been asking for more money. So there's the challenge, guys. Go and ask for some money Go and ask Heritage for more Lottery. Money. Um, we're and right. you, you can ask for more time? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we're nearly there. One follow-up, we have a plan. We need to have a plan. And then finally, on the reaching across the region, first of all, do we need to work across the region? Um, that it's, culture is very localised, but also we, work, we should only really work where it makes sense, not across everything. There is a need to do everything together. Um, and how we can work practically rather than try and formalise it. Again, it needs to work to a plan. Super. A lot to digest. Sarah. So I was um, in focusing on festivals and also celebrating our community. So focusing on festivals, I think, to give you a flavour of the conversation, um, Donna made the point that festivals were like the extreme sports of culture, which I thought was a great phrase because actually they were very high risk but high reward as well. So um, a lot of what we spoke about was about how we sort of mitigated the risks involved and how we enabled those things to happen. So key opportunities were around ambition, that we have ambition as a city, the creativity we already have here, experience and expertise you know we, we've got a lot of that a lot of enthusiasm great green spaces the the water that we've spoken about already and actually a local authority that was listening that um the licensing team the events team they were there to support us and with the strategy recently developed that was a real opportunity for us so now it felt like the next step was really cascading the vision ensuring that the vision that was at the most senior level of the local authority was cascaded to all departments and right across Across the city so that people felt that it was their moment to create festivals. Some of the challenges we talked about were physical infrastructure, um, how we ensure accessibility into some of those open spaces when we, when we um, put on festivals. Uh, but we absolutely came back around to talking about the opportunity that there was here and actually in some ways the fact that we are not doing lots of festivals currently was a massive opportunity for us and the importance that we looked at festivals from the very, very grassroots, smallest scale to the mid-scale to the large scale. And by doing that, that we would be able to develop an infrastructure so that people were performing in the festivals, working in the festivals, volunteering, making them happen, and that we would grow our own workforce to develop that further. And I think the key takeaway from me, we talked a lot about failure. We talked about embracing failure. The panel gave some excellent examples of failures they've had, so, so <laughs> check in with anyone else that has went to the session to find out about those. Um, but uh, yeah, it was like, actually, it can take three years to make a festival work or more, so actually you need to hold that course. So coming on to then celebrating community, um, we talked about some of the key challenges there were around trust, and I think you know we mentioned that already, that actually that, that, that takes time and resource, and it's, and it's an investment for the long term. So how we build trust, how we ensure we have transparency of communication, that we go back to people. We ask them the question about what they want, we now need to go back to them and talk to them about what's possible. Um, but we said there were lots of opportunities, again, around ambition, and the thread that came up in both of those sessions, speaking back to one of the earlier sessions, was about this notion of giving away power but holding responsibility so that was talked about a lot and and how that could what that could mean in terms of festivals in terms of community engagement so 
to some we sort of said about a moment in time that actually this community engagement festivals they're a moment in time and they create their own community so yeah if we hold the course we can do something great with that thank you very much finally claire um well i've been to i've tried to, to go to absolutely uh, everything so i've been to parts of everything this afternoon my step rate is is well up for today <laughs> so i'm really pleased um, I mean, there's been so many uh, great uh, uh, panellists, and I just want to say a huge thank you to, to everyone. But I suppose, um, for me, if there's one thing that I've taken from today, it was Alan Lane's comment about uh, serving your community. And I think that's going to be up in my office. That's going to be something that I look at every day. And if I can... Um, be at this conference when we hold it again in two years time and, and, and look myself in the eye and feel that the two years have been about serving the community and I fulfilled that then then I, I think that will be a marker of success so been so many I mean some of the things that have already been said I think Alan I'm, Lane also said you have to produce the one thing he'll remember before he dies not setting the bar too high. Yes. Um, so, well, that's okay. That's a challenge. I'm not frightened of that challenge. That's fine. <laughs> uh, we can do that. To, we can do that together. I think the other thing is that, um, you know, we, we talked this morning about the bid being published on Monday. Finally, we've got permission to do that. And the programme that the Culture Trust is going to be taking forward is drawn from that bid. We, we can't do everything in it. And we've tried to think very carefully about the things which will fulfill our, our theory of change most effectively. Um, and that programme was drawn from the consultation. So that is the city's programme. Now, there may be things in there that certain people don't like or it doesn't resonate with, but it all came from the consultation. I can hand on my heart say there is not one project that I sort of came and said, oh, whatever Southampton says, we're going to do X. All of it came from that huge consultation that was with over 8,000 uh, voices and you know hours and hours of talking during COVID when we couldn't meet face to face. So when uh, you know over the next three years we are putting the programme together then that has you know you have all contributed to that process and there will also be the opportunity to continue contributing because we're going to have a series of, of groups that people can be involved in and that will be rolled out um, later this year when um, the, the city, uh, the, the, the Culture Trust team is more than me <laughs> um, and we've actually got, you know, got a team around it. Um, but I can guarantee, because that was one of the things that people really did like, which was having our working groups and having the opportunity to, to talk and to contribute and that will continue.